out yet, and Maori, uh, not yet, and actually Otoko. That's uh, the greeting in my native language from Chile. So, as Hamish mentioned, I'm Chao. Um, <laughs> this is me as a child with my grandfather. <laughs> so, I come from, <coughs> my mom is actually Rotuman, and my dad is Chinese Fijian, so I look quite mixed. Uh, and as Hamish mentioned, I'm actually from Suva, but I have ties to Rotuma and Kailuku, which is where my dad is from. And I'm part of the Pacific Note Partnership, which is a relationship between SPREP and the University of Newcastle. So we have six PhD students from the Pacific currently studying at the University of Newcastle. So um, if you were at the breakfast session this morning, um, Lani talked about her story <laughs> as a woman in Tohias in the Pacific. And common across the Pacific is story time. Uh, so this is Hanuchu, which is what we call story time. <laughs> it could be a fictitious tale or a tale of trying to pass down culture and traditions, but even stories, uh, stories of lineage, so where we came from. So this is where my mom is from. <laughs> I, I'm a bit clumsy. <laughs> um, so this is where my mom is from. My grandparents are from Malhaha, where the airport is located, the only airport in Rutuma. And my grandmother is from Mutusa. So <laughs> if you've been to Fiji and you've interacted with some Rutumans, you'd probably know that we are called biscuites or biscuits. Um, that's because in the 19th century, when people of Rituma interacted with sailors that came to the island, they got fascinated with all the biscuits they had on the ship, that they took some back and tried to plant it in the ground in Rituma. <laughs> so we loved it so much that we got called biscuitas <laughs> or biscuits. So you might be wondering what the heck my talk is about. Um, it's something that I consciously keep thinking about, um, and I think a lot of you also keep thinking about, it's about biases and opinions and how we curate data or we map data. And I'm looking in particular at the context of OpenStreetMaps um, and the role of our local mapping community. So as you know, I'm part of Open Fiji, which Lani, Salope, and Namaya is a part of, and Nico's been really instrumental as well, and even John, <laughs> who's up there. <laughs> Um, so I want to use examples of the OSM ecosystem and apply to why this would matter in the Pacific. And when I mean data curation, again, I mean mapping and contributing to building the map. So if you look at this picture, you might think one of two things. Um, if you're from the Pacific, it would be definitely <laughs> different from what someone else, maybe Alex <laughs> or maybe Jonathan Cuts <laughs> or maybe even John might think about. Um, so think about what you see in this picture. <laughs> For a lot of Pacific Islanders, we think of these as weapons of mom's uh, discipline. <laughs> if you don't do your chores, you get chased around outside with a broom. Maybe you'll get a flip-flop thrown at you and you have to dodge it a little. <laughs> or you might think, oh, this is cool, some island lifestyle kind of thing, you know, where you do your Saturday cleaning. but. Yeah, these are things that we are terrified of and have trauma from in our homes. <laughs> so let's talk about how do we usually think. You might notice that you have two systems in your brain. I'm not a psychologist. My mom actually studied psychology. <laughs> so she made us read this book called Thinking Fast and Thinking, uh, Thinking Slow <coughs> by, uh, I can't pronounce his name, but I think a lot of people have read this book. And just the basis of the book is that we have two systems about how we think, the first one being fast, intuitive, and um, the second one being slow and deliberate. So your system one would be walking to the conference venue, um, driving down to your local store, because it's something that you don't have to consciously think about because you've done it a million times. Whereas system two, it's a bit slower. If you're new to this conference, maybe you're like, who do I sit with? <laughs> who do I know? <laughs> maybe it's a mathematical equation calculating how much time it's going to take to come to this venue and the yeah, amount of time that you have to get ready. <laughs> so the way we think can also <coughs> impact, I mean, we all have unconscious biases. 
um, it's wired within our brain. And these could be learned through our environment. So when you think of the photo I showed of the broom and the candles, <laughs> when we look at it, our unconscious bias, or for me in particular, is to run. <laughs> <laughs> for some of you, it might be that's a really great cleaning tool. I wanna, I wanna use that. <laughs> it does, it does really, it's really effective at, at our brain, for example. Um, but yeah, unconscious bias relates to the perceptions that you acquire from the environment, and this could be specific to the society that we live in or are from, and the geography that we also are from. <laughs> so it affects our thinking, so how we approach people, um, maybe with prejudice, and we won't even know about it. It affects our ability to judge people and understand or even build in relationships. And it can reduce our effectiveness as you know, team players or being members of a community. And from research, I think we can understand that there are a lot of unconscious biases that affect our current society today. You know, tall men are promoted more than shorter men, apparently. <laughs> um, white women are paid more than colored women. Bald men apparently make less money than men. <laughs> with a full head of hair. I don't know where that one came from. <laughs> I know a lot of bald men that earn a lot of money. <laughs> and men in general are paid more than women. I think that's one we all can probably agree on. And if you look around, you can see more examples around you. You know, we're all sitting with people that we know that we're comfortable with. We're sitting with people that we have an affinity with. <laughs> I'll point at the <laughs> obvious trait there. They all have one thing in common. They all work at SPC. They're all from Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> and you could probably look around at your table and you probably notice that, yeah, I have an affinity with these people. Maybe that's my unconscious bias working. So we can all have good intentions, um, but trying to be aware of the biases that we hold, especially when we're creating data uh, or even creating tools, um, I think it helps in the way that we actually contribute to our society. And I also <laughs> I think about how I'm biased. Um, and there are moments where I realize I suffer from these biased opinions, um, where I look at authority figures, for example. <laughs> I'm more inclined to listen and take advice from my supervisors who know nothing about my job. <laughs> 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 they have the technical knowledge, but they've never really worked in the Pacific. So, you know, I take that. So it's it's a bit of unlearning for me. Sometimes I feel like I'm being colonized in my own lab. <laughs> I'm actually the only brown person. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, for people that are minorities, it's a very, should I say vulnerable, it's, it's a very vulnerable feeling to be in a room full of people that you don't really have this connection with. Um, yeah, don't, don't cry. <laughs> Um, so we can all agree that data is, plays a very important role, that's why we're here. Um, but also it's likely to be uh, the fabric of modern society. It, infects, uh, it affects how we make decisions and even at various scales, whether that's at the community level or even national level. And if you're not, <coughs> sorry. So we're all telling different stories through our data. So our data is biased in some kind of way. And because of how we perceive it, there's also a social and political dimension often attached to it that we forget sometimes. And data and biases can lead to misrepresenting <laughs> a population because we're dealing with inaccurate, incomplete, and incompatib incompatible data sets that fail to represent the entire population. So one of the questions that we had in OS and Fiji is why are people failing, I shouldn't say failing, why are people not consuming the data that we've created? So you have to also think about how we're impacting people's livelihoods. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know about redlining in the US. That was a very like discriminatory practice based on where people live. And it's probably a bit of a stretch of an example <laughs> because it's in the US. But I mean, it shows how discriminating against neighborhoods, minorities, and even ethnic minorities and, <laughs> um, and low income residents can really impact uh, people's livelihoods. So when we think of collecting data or creating maps, there are several factors that we actually need to think about. <coughs> um, and this looks at who does the data benefit. Is it the curator itself? You're trying to make some kind of economic gain from the data, or are you trying to change society? And so what are the potential impacts of these 
data and the biases associated with your data that you're creating, and are you actually representing the local context of it? So when we look at <laughs> OpenStreetMap, we love OpenStreetMap. It's free, it's open, it's a collaborative project. And when you look at open collaboration and the definition of open collaboration, <coughs> it's defined as any system of innovation or production that relies on goal-oriented <laughs> yet loosely coordinated participants. And these people interact to create a product of economic value that is made available to contributors and non-contributors alike. So you have to think about who does OpenStreetMap really benefit? Is it for the communities that you're contributing for? You know, when you're responding to humanitarian <laughs> disasters and you're um, doing some mapping, so crisis response mapping, like what's the benefit? A lot of us get together and we sit in a room and we want to contribute <laughs> because of the impacts that these communities face from disasters or humanitarian uh, conflicts. And I think that's a very, I want to say, it's a very moving way to contribute your time as a volunteer. But sometimes we forget um, about the local context. So it was really interesting for me to look at the OpenStreetMap Foundation survey. Uh, these were the comments that came out of the 2021 survey. <coughs> and I'll be honest, I kind of agreed in the beginning. So I started working with OpenStreetMap in 2016. This is when I was doing my master's in the University of Leicester in the UK. And I thought about, oh, you know, these places are unmapped and we need to create um, data for them to help inform. But so for me, I viewed data and mapping and contributing to OSM as any data being good data depending on how we use it. But sometimes we forget that because it, we have biases with our data, we're actually showing one picture of the whole story. <laughs> so this is someone's comment where they talk about, you know, don't bring in more women. Who needs women in the room? Don't bring some gay people. Don't bring some colored people into OSM. And I think that creates a community that's very exclusive. It makes people feel uh, disengaged and not want to actually participate in community. I agree that OSM is not about gender or color. I do agree that it is about a map, but it's also about representing people best in the way that fits uh, the context. So there's been a lots, lots, lots of studies um, on OpenStreetMap and what the data does represent. There's a lot of biases in the map. You see that men are contributing higher volumes of data and time uh, than women. And if you look at the percentage, it's 87% um, of more time and more uh, contributions spent in OSM activities than women, which is very significant. Um, and that also working age male populations or participants have a larger, contribute to larger geographic extents um, than women of the same age. Um, there's also a table of the the tasking manager, um, I know that a large percentage of them, there's no data or they prefer not to say, but if you look at the male and the female, the people that do identify in these gender categories, obviously there's a difference in the uh, percentage of gender. <laughs> and I think this is really a good example of who's actually contributing to the map and what does the map best represent. So there's a very big difference in the volume of contributed data um, between richer countries and poor countries. I think we all know that. Uh, you look at the OSMF board, <laughs> there's a bunch of, I shouldn't say a bunch. There's a higher percentage of men from uh, European and Western countries, and there's probably only one or two people from the global south, and one of them being a woman that's actually from a developing country. There's also a complex unequal spatial pattern of biases that remain, and this varies across human uh, dependent, uh, various human development index groups, population sizes, and geographic regions. So if you look, oh, you can't see. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the graph, I think, is very interesting. It's from a paper by Ben Herford. Herford I probably butchered his name, I'm so sorry. <laughs> But he does some really interesting research in looking at the spatial biases of uh, OpenStreetMap data. And what he found was that OSM was strongly biased towards regions with higher human development indexes, right? So 
<laughs> I feel like at this point now you all care about diversity. <laughs> but <laughs> so I don't know if I should explain it, but you know, in data curation and community building, it's essential that context is represented. So um, this is through gender, racial minorities, geographic regions, socioeconomic, people from socioeconomic backgrounds, and um, understanding what the global map map represents and if it represents our community in a very sustainable manner but in a very ethical way as well. So when you look at the Pacific, you think what a vast ocean space. <laughs> Where are these people from? <laughs> How did they get? I'm kidding. <laughs> so when you think of the Pacific, you probably think of sunshine, ocean, you probably think of swimming around. Um, but there's lots of different cultures that make up the Pacific. There's a combined total of 2.3 million people in the Pacific. I know it's not a lot, but it's quite significant when you think of the land sizes across the region. There's almost, it says 30,000 islands, but I, th uh, 3,000 islands, but I believe there's more islands that are accounted for across the region. And the ocean space spans 15% of the Earth's surface. So while there is diversity across the Pacific region, um, there's also disparity in the challenges that we face. So when you <laughs> look at Fiji, um, I think a lot of people in the country don't realize how privileged they are com compared to smaller countries such as Tuvalu and Nauru that have an estimated population size of 11,000 people. And that's not a lot of people. <laughs> um, yeah, <coughs> and if you have been to Kiribati, I think I, uh, I don't know if she's here, she did some really interesting work with this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I actually went to Kiribati for a holiday, which I was like, why would you go? <laughs> I've been to Kiribati, I was stranded for a bit. Um, but I think being in these settings, you realize how diverse our challenges are across the region. Um, in the first photo, you notice there's two photos, one of a uh, structure that's actually a refugee processing center in Nauru. Um, it was empty when I visited. Um, the other photo of the beach, that's actually the, <laughs> that's actually the lagoon area in Kiribati. Uh, if you've been to Kiribati or Tarawa, you'd probably know what the lagoon means. Um, and then the <laughs> other photos are uh, from Kiribati and Fiji and uh, Maui. So again, when I talk about storytelling, um, the people in the Pacific have a long history of voyaging. And these are often passed through story times, so like Hanuchu, which is what I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and we have a history of people writing our own stories and imparting their own narrative. And long before there was a Captain Cook and William Bly writing our histories, this was passed down from generation to generation. We were known as great seafarers and travelers across the ocean. And even when Captain Cook arrived in Fiji, <laughs> um, the reason he called Fiji is because Tongan people actually called Fiji, was it Viti? Oh, <laughs> I'm probably misread. I'm not very good at history, but I'm trying. <laughs> but they traveled across a vast ocean space, um, trying to find places that are home. But we, it was only through our, the Western explorers that actually came down and wrote our history. So these are quite biases, and we're trying to get back to practices where we're able to tell stories, not only through story time or verbal communication, but also through the data that we curate. So again, why should we care about data <laughs> uh, in the Pacific and also the diversity? Again, capturing the context is very important. The governing of infrastructure across the region is very different. Um, when you look at the geospatial context and data management, for example, Vanuatu is the only country that has a geospatial data management policy. Fiji and Tonga are currently in progress um, also, the distribution of wealth and resources and human capacity is disparate, and it's very important for us to have local ownership of our resources and our data. Um, in, the, in Fiji, for example, the majority of the land tenure is actually native. It's owned by our indigenous people, um, and the same can be said for Samoa and Tonga. So when you go and collect data, do field work, there's a lot of consultation involved because you have to work with the communities to get the appropriate um, permissions to access their land, for example. So this can be quite time consuming. <laughs> um, but over time, working in the Pacific, what I've seen is sometimes there's a race to you know, be the first to do something in the Pacific. 
So you have to think about whether we're trying to build capability or are we building the portfolios? You know, are we building, are we trying to stamp our mark in a place because it's never been done? Yeah, you can. So we should consider traditional practices and the norm. Um, I think Maria mentioned when she tried to do some field work in, um, oh, hang on. <laughs> in one of the atoll islands, she couldn't access it because someone had died. So things like cultural norms, like taboos, where you're not able to access sites, is something that I think not a lot of us are aware of. Um, I recently came back from a fee from some field work in Samoa. I couldn't access communities because the cultural norm to access uh, native land in Samoa is you actually pay to access it because they want to benefit from what you're actually collecting because they're tired of people coming in and collecting information and not getting any benefit out of it. So again, this ties into the economic disparity across the Pacific, and we have a lot of unique systems and structures. <laughs> So a good example is in Nauru, it's so small <laughs> that um, even though the ministries are located next to each other and there's probably three or four people in each ministry, they still have like all these complex data governance uh, structures. So even to request data from one ministry to another, it doesn't take like just go out for coffee and I'm going to give you the data. It takes like months <laughs> to get done. <laughs> <laughs> because they overcomplicate things, you know, because, well, it's a very, um, how do you say, it's a bit of a political issue, in, you know, now we're considering the situation with Australia and the refugees, but <laughs> uh, they, they protect their data because they're afraid of what's going to come out of it. Yeah, so when we think of curating data, obviously we have a lot of regional organizations like SPREB and SBC, and the way that they curate data is they look at community-based approaches. They look mainly at consulting with these communities. They look at the long-term cooperation with governments, international organizations. And uh, yeah, being able to include community-based approaches uh, really works well and ensures that there's sustained development. So this is one example that I want to talk about. This was from Cyclone Winston in 2016. Um, Salwate actually <laughs> worked with me on this with a team from the Ministry of Lands and SBC. So this is when I was a civil servant. <laughs> um, and yet, yeah, while there was a race to be the first to do something, it's because we're responding to a crisis. Um, so we tried to get the data out as quickly as possible before teams from multiple organizations were being deployed to affected communities. Um, we didn't use open street mapping because it wasn't something that was used um, and because there was a lot of, what should I say, I want to say biases, <laughs> but I think there wasn't enough awareness on the value of open street map at the time. Um, so we had to rely on aerial images that were captured by, I think it was the New Zealand Air Force and as well as the Australian Navy or something. They flew some drones and some planes and collected some really good uh, information for us to get the inform uh, <laughs> to get some aerial images to get information out quickly. Um, but looking at the on the ground context is completely different from what we're seeing. But it really helped the communities come together when these this information was collected and distributed, um, and it helped them build resilience towards responding to uh, rebuilding. So this is actually. In Tailevu, this is where my dad is from. It's in the senior village. This is <laughs> the building that my grandfather, who was a carpenter, built. This was the emergency uh, building, uh, emergency evacuation center. So they all huddled in here um, during the cyclone, which was a category five cyclone because there was complete devastation in the community. So a lot of them were actually living in tents. This was a month after tropical cyclone <laughs> Winston um, hit. And you see a lot of uh, the homes and even their natural resources. So they sell pine. Um, <laughs> the community sells pine to bring in income for the village. Um, and this helps them sustain themselves because a lot of our communities are, what is it? <laughs> they're self, they sell, <laughs> they're, um, what's the word? Semi subsistence, subsistence, they live on subsistence, they have a subsistence lifestyle sorry that's just <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> um, so 
my parents and I went to visit Nasini village. Uh, we took the map along that we had generated from this disaster response. And um, by distributing this map, we were able to get uh, community, so people from the village that are currently you know, in better positions economically to contribute some money to help these people move out of the, the tents that they're currently living. Yeah, so I think this is where the role of local mapping communities come in. Uh, and I think that's something that's been missing for a long time in Fiji, but also in other Pacific Island countries. Again, we have this tradition of knowledge sharing. So being able to capture our local context is really empowering and builds, you know, a, so a sense of independence. Um, and it also allows us to have that local ownership of the data. So when we talk about building local capacity and local communities running this, you know, you can choose between Western methodologies or even traditional approaches. Um, it also helps us uh, enhance the awareness of what's happening in our region and maybe adopt tools and practices that are successfully implemented in other communities. And also our local, commu <laughs> local mapping communities are connectors to external mapping bodies like HOT OSM or even the Pacific GIS and Remote Sensing User Group or even OSG Oceania, <laughs> for example. So these are some community initiatives that are currently uh, running across the Pacific. You have KWIM. They recently launched a website and they want me to tell you all about it. <laughs> it's great. Um, and when Aya visited Kiribati, she mentioned that she actually went and did some GIS training. And a lot of people actually turned up. So KWM is focused on promoting the importance of women and, uh, sorry, mapping and open source solutions to address challenges of climate change and sustainable development. Uh, 66, around 60 to 66 percent of their membership is actually women, because um, they want to empower women and their ability to map um, and promote the importance of open source. And then you also have the Samoa GIS and Remote Sensing User Group. If you met Tor at the conference last year, she actually talked a little bit about SCRUG. Um, and they encourage a professional network to um, skill share and build capacity. So they ran a couple of trainings, had some really fun social activities, and also ha hosted the Fos Fiji Regional uh, the Local Hub in Samoa during the conference. And then we have OSM Fiji. <laughs> um, so OSM Fiji is more of a initiative where we try and encourage our professional body, but also the students and those people interested in geospatial technology or mapping uh, to come together and contribute to OpenStreetMap. We're trying to move out of OpenStreetMap and encourage them to network and foster that relationship, like Lani <laughs> mentioned today, which was very important, uh, to help them find career paths in geospatial that are not currently being filled in Fiji, but have the potential to be filled. Yeah, so again, I guess this is why it's important for local mapping communities. Uh, they contribute the local context to OpenStreetMap at a wider scale. So when you think of what you can do, I'll leave you with this word, it's called Fa Aso. This is a Rotuman word, which is how we described Westerners coming to Rotuma. And Fa Aso, it means being an assistant to local and having good intentions, despite, you know, maybe your personality is not that great. Because <laughs> a lot of these sailors that came to Rotuma, they were actually um, not very good people, <laughs> is how I'd put it. Um, so they actually took up a role of helping chiefs make decisions in the communities to better the Rotuman people. And the Rotuman people believed in autonomy, so they looked at the character of people and allowed them to come in and interact mingle, <laughs> but have a, I wouldn't say an assistant role, but a role that is of positive influence. And I want to say like Fa Aso is someone that I really, like I would call John. <laughs> uh, John actually helped us start OSM Fiji in the beginning. Um, and because of his knowledge and understanding what we're lacking, um, it allows you to create that awareness and be inclusive of the people uh, that for the community that you're building. Uh, you're thinking about the sustainability of the community, the infrastructure, uh, and you're also thinking of encouraging self-sustaining communities. Um, so we have to consider what motivates our local communities. Um, yeah. So try and be a fa'aswa. 
try not to change that word. It comes close to a bit of a swear word. <laughs> um, but there's also a talk that I would encourage you all to have a look at. It's uh, by Dito and uh, David Garcia from the 2019 State of the Map, where they talk about hashtag pass the map. So if you don't know anything, you know, pass the map to us, because <laughs> we can fill it, because it's you know, our community. Um, yeah, so this is it. I want to say thank you. I want to acknowledge my community, Anali and uh, Ikea, who contributed a lot to this presentation. And I hope you learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. Okay. Hi, Carol. I'm here. So, so my question, so what's next uh, for this uh, open street map and local communities? Like, uh, especially coming from HOT, I would really love to know how I could best support you and your uh, community. Okay. <laughs> um, so what I found with the local community, so the three that I mentioned, um, majority of the people that are leading the initiatives are women. Um, so it's really hard to find support because it's a small community in each of these countries. So I think the support from external bodies are really important, but also from our own uh, mapping communities. For us, OSMPG case, <laughs> there's been a lot of turns and redirections because we're trying to make stronger connections with our local mapping bodies like the GIS and Remote Sensing User Forum in uh, that's hosted by the Ministry of Lands. They're slowly consuming the data and they're encouraging activities. Um, but one thing we want to encourage is bringing up the local, I shouldn't say local, <laughs> the younger generation of our uh, geospatial technicians. So we want to release a mentorship program that I've talked to Ellie about. I can bring it. <laughs> um, so hopefully that'll encourage them to kind of take a step forward and lead these uh, communities. Uh, hi there, uh, I'm over here in the corner. Um, hi, that was really um, that was really interesting. I was just wondering uh, if uh, if if you've got because you've talked about sort of how sometimes there's sort of biases and these systems don't necessarily accommodate community or local knowledge um, in, a, in a respectful way. I was just wondering if you've got examples of that, um, any instances to just help help me kind of grasp what you're talking about. Okay, uh, I'll give you an example. <laughs> um, so this was early on when we started OpenStreetMap Fiji. Um, one of the participants wanted to participate in mapping reefs. Um, and I think it's great, but when you look at the marine uh, parks, or should I say parks, the marine ecosystem in uh, Fiji, these are managed by village communities. So having to map these reef communities, it kind of goes against uh, the cust let's say customs. But being able to provide that information is kind of a political but also a socioeconomic thing. A lot of these villages make money from um, leasing out their, is it the fishing areas for people to come in and fish? So being able to tell them where certain marine resources, particularly on OSM, and allowing them to access it is a bit of a political thing. <laughs> I would require permissions from these villages to map. Um, so that's something that we took, oh, I shouldn't say we, I, sh I say Namaya and I actually took it into context because we didn't want to overstep. Thank you. 